Welcome back to Vancouver Carpenter, you guys. Today, I'm gonna to show you guys how to repair Jiprock lath plaster with drywall. So first off, what is Jiprock lath? Well, it's a method of plastering over top of thin boards of drywall that was used from about the 1950s to maybe the late 1960s. This was the precursor to regular drywall use. I think it's actually a really good and really strong method of plastering a house. Let's take a real quick look as best we can to figure out what it is. Okay, disregard this plywood right here because I installed that, but as we can see, we've got this drywall installed onto the studs. It's about three eighths of an inch thick and they plastered over top of everything. So about three eighths to a half inch of plaster over top of everywhere. We could see the edge of the board there. In the corners, they would still use the diamond lath to reinforce it. That's this stuff. So I think this was a really solid method of making walls for a house because for one, it sped up the process of lathing the house. So the lathe in this case is not the thin wood strips. It's actually three eighths inch drywall that was usually about maybe, I think it was like two foot wide panels and that was installed on all the walls and then they just plastered right over top of that, just using the diamond lath in the corners for reinforcement to stop cracks there. So most of this stuff is now about, what are we looking at? Um, 60s to now, so like 60 to 70 years old. And a lot of it's still in really good shape. As long as they fasten the drywall onto the walls really well and did a decently thick coat of plaster over top, most of what I have ever worked with and seen is still in really good shape, especially compared to the old school lath and plaster, the wood strips. So the trickiest part in repairing all of this stuff is the totally varying thicknesses. So the first thing I did was I walked around and I checked at every stud. So along the walls, it was three quarters of an inch. What I'm going to do is put quarter inch strips of drywall here to fur it out so the half inch ends up flush. The ceiling was a pretty consistent seven eighths. So what I'm doing here is I've added three eighths plywood onto all of the joists. And once I add half inch drywall, that's gonna make it a pretty consistent seven eighths all the way across. So unfortunately I've taped over it already cause I wasn't actually planning on filming this. But what I did here was I managed to be able to stuff 3 8 plywood in behind the plaster because all of this stuff above the windows was wobbling all over the place. So I managed to get the 3 8 in behind there. It's screwed off to the header here. Because it is actually drywall behind it, you can sink a few screws here and there. What tends to happen is the plaster will blow out, but it will grab the gyprock lath behind it. And then once I managed to get it not moving, I just kind of cocked the edge of this with some PL. So that way this plaster is now super solid because what I was worried about was once I added my drywall here, if this part's flopping all over the place, then it's gonna crack down the road. So I would say the two most important things, and this applies to any tying into plaster job, is firstly, you gotta make sure that everything is sound and that will totally vary depending on the job. This job didn't require much to make the original plaster sound because it was in good shape. But the second thing, and this one is the most important when it comes to how flat your walls are and how nice your finish is, is you want to get your shims as close as possible to helping the drywall be totally flush. So in this case, I'm going to be plus or minus about a 16th all the way along. Because plaster isn't necessarily uniform, it's applied by hand. Um, they did a great job here. I'm impressed at how uniform it was, but it's not gonna be perfect. So this quarter inch shim is gonna bring my half inch drywall out to basically flush, again, plus or minus a 16th, which will get all evened out in the pre-fill. So one thing to keep in mind is because we had to shim this out and this shim material, the quarter inch drywall, doesn't have any screw holding capacity, you have to make sure that you use the appropriate length screws for all your next pieces. So in this case, because it was just quarter inch, I've just sized up to inch and five eighths, which is the next available size up. Now what I didn't do was mark out all of my stud locations everywhere. But because we have a top plate here, I believe there's actually something everywhere. <laughs> 
Another thing about tying drywall into plaster is it's impossible to get nice tight joints. So let's take a look at these. So because of all the stuff that's just in the way, you're never gonna get that board up tight and close up those joints. I mean, this one could have been an eighth over, but we're gonna be pre-filling everything. As you can see, there's just a lot of room for error. You know, we're pretty nice and tight there, almost not enough to even get mud into. And then again, when we look at this ceiling, we can see like, it's just not really possible to get it totally up close and tight. So there's really no need to panic. We're gonna be pre-filling all of this stuff. And as the old schoolers say, tapes two inches wide. So next thing we gotta do, scrape off all the loose stuff. So anything that isn't still stuck to the wall, gotta come off. And as for this stuff, basically if it's under the surface of the wall and will get filled, it's no problem. But if it's sticking up, you gotta do something about it. Give it a little help if it needs it. Got some of that wire here. I'm just gonna bend it until it's under the surface. Nothing too fancy. Okay, now it's time for everybody's favorite part. Just fill it. So I'm using what's called concrete fill. Uh, this stuff, I've made videos about it. It's the one that I called the training wheel mud. Great stuff. But for 90% of you, basically everyone that doesn't live in Western Canada, you're just gonna use hot mud here. Just quick set. And we're just taking this opportunity to flatten everything out as well as possible so that we can put some tape over top of it. So I've finished all the pre-fill. I'm waiting for it to set up before I can scrape down any high spots. Let's take a quick look at it so you can see what it should look like. So as we can see, because it's not guaranteed to be level or even everywhere, there ends up being quite a wide pre-fill just to make sure that you can get it flat enough for tape and that you can minimize how much mud you have to put on after, especially on the ceiling. So, this drywall on the ceiling here was just a little bit proud almost everywhere. So it's feathered out pretty wide so that when I go put that tape on that I don't have a giant hump to feather out, that it's more just a long flat thing. Basically, all this confill that I put on is drying out today instead of tomorrow. So because I've been doing this a while, my pre is pretty flat, but I often have a little bit in the corners here. The less you leave, the less lumps you leave under the tape, the flatter your work's gonna be. Oh, see, it's still not quite set up enough. The stuff over the painted surface is pulling and dragging, whereas the stuff over the drywall, totally ready to scrape. There's the pulling and dragging, if you guys couldn't see it. I'm just gonna leave that alone. To tape this job, I'm gonna be doing the super taper slot bucket method. There's no advantage to getting out any of the fancy taping tools for this one. I'll spend more time cleaning them. And there's only about 50 feet of those valences being replaced. So, you know, this'll be probably the fastest way to tape it, given the fact that it's too small to bring out the fancy tools, but too big to just straight hand tape. This should be the happy medium. So it's pretty rudimentary, but it works. Just making sure that I really try and center those tapes so that I'm covering that whole like three quarter of an inch gap. And I usually just stop right about there. I've shown this method plenty of times. Like this is nothing new. Yeah, I've definitely shown this a lot. 
Yeah, there's not much to it. Now I'll do the rest of the overlapping ones. You get the picture. You don't need to see me do it all. May as well coat that screw while I see it. So just got this all taped and got my system down towards the end when I wasn't filming at all. This room is the longest one. It's about 22 feet. Why don't we take a quick look at it? So as we can see, I got my system for taping those up quickly done. I just put them all on at the same time and wiped them out. Everything's looking pretty nice and flat. This is gonna be a pretty fast and easy coat because of all the pre-fill and building stuff up in advance. Nothing's gonna to take too much mud. So it won't take too many days to dry. As you can see, I used all paper tape, my favorite. So there could have been a lot of different ways to do this, different methods, different tapes, different muds, but I always just like to go back to Old Faithful. Uh, for me, it's the fastest and easiest. I'm not planning on getting another coat on this today. I'm planning on just doing it, you know, tape one day, first coat another day, second coat another day, just the standard because it's a bit too big to try and get it all done in one day. So I really don't wanna waste my time trying to like do multiple coats in a day when it's like just a little bit too big. Well, you guys, I never actually ended up filming any more specific content for this video because that was about the gist of it. I did film two more videos related to doing the first coat and the second coat on this about kind of a different topic. So if you're interested um, you can check those out maybe i already posted them i don't know what order i'm actually going to post these videos but yeah after taping it it was pretty simple it was just coat sand coat sand you guys know the drill so um yeah it's pretty simple when it comes to doing like once you've got the tape on a uh, plaster tie-in starts to get pretty easy the only thing you really need to know is that like you're probably gonna have to build it out pretty wide. Um, that's part of the reason we do so much shimming in the beginning stage is to minimize how far you have to build it out. But plaster is never even, the framing is never gonna be perfect. So it's going to take a little bit of mud framing to make up the extra. But before we go, let's just take a real quick look at this. The lighting's not the best, but you can see, I mean, it's sanded and it looks good. So as you can see, it looks like walls now. Doesn't look like holes in the walls anymore. These windows have not been helping me film an easy video. But yeah, that's it. There's about 45 feet of this stuff to do and it's all done now. And that wraps up your basic Jiprock lath plaster to drywall tie-in. Um, hopefully this video wasn't too dry for you guys and there was some pertinent information. There wasn't too many ways I could really spice this one up. I just wanted to get it done. I didn't want to overdo the filming and just show like so much random boring stuff. And as always guys, I hope your project's going well, but I hope you're doing even better. I really mean it. Um, thanks for watching. Yeah, this video is done. Till the next one.